Hey friends! Now so far in our series we built a basic shellcode loader template, we added a remote payload feature and then we also learned how to hide the console window. And all of this was of course done in the quest to become elite by attempting to one day perform the enigmatic righteous hack. Big ups Phantom Freak. Now up until this point I've purposely held back in terms of discussing the theory of evading detection or any theory really for that matter. And that's just because my general approach to teaching is based on the belief that it's much easier to understand concepts that are based on things you've already directly experienced, as opposed to attempting to download a whole abstract framework through rote memorization. This is just based on my own experience. I teach the way I like to be taught. But alas, the time has come, and so I think now at this point is an ideal moment to explore a bit of theory. So that being the case, in this video we'll spend a bit of time initially discussing detection evasion, but more so really we'll just do a very high level exploration of modern detection. Because of course in order to know how to evade detection, we have to first come to grips with how detection actually works. Now to reiterate, this will be a very high level exploration of detection evasion, it's just to introduce you to the overall conceptual scaffolding. In future lectures, we'll layer on top of this and we'll continue to learn about detection evasion here on forward, since it's really in many ways the most important thing when it comes to creating malware. Sure, of course you need to know how to code in some language, and you need to know the basics of how to at least make your payload execute. But you'll soon see that beyond this foundation, most of our time will be spent understanding elements of detection and then how to evade it. That's because ultimately building a functional payload is pretty simple. But creating a payload that won't be detected? Well that can range from tricky to near impossible. And it is constantly getting harder too. So today then we'll first learn about some basic theory about detection in part 1. And then in part 2 we'll review the code as we have it up until this point. And then we'll apply our newfound understanding of how detection works to make seven different improvements to our code. Now just one thing before we get going, our code is gonna end up getting pretty big from this point on forward, so it's gonna be kinda awkward to displace all of the code on the screen at the same time. That being the case, I'm not really gonna do so anymore. You should have some basic understanding of the overall components that make up the code, and if you don't, then I encourage you to go review episodes one and two again. So you can find a link of the code right at the top of the description. I encourage you to go download it, open it in your favorite text editor and then as we cover different individual pieces you can always refer back to this so it can serve as a kind of overall map of the terrain. And so that's it, let's get to it. And so the first thing I think we should do is just get a basic understanding of the terms out of the way. And that's because I've noticed that many people, and myself foremost among them, frequently bend the terms and then conflate different ideas. For example, we often use static and signature analysis interchangeably, but these are actually not the same thing. So let's just get a wee bit pedantic about this for a while, and then we'll have a solid foundation to make sense of everything. And so there are two distinct definition sets I want us to consider. First, there is static as opposed to dynamic analysis. And then there is signature versus heuristics versus behavioral detection. So let's first consider static versus dynamic analysis, which is really more of a classification than an explicit type of detection per se. Now with static analysis, it's all about what a file is. For example, the code and structure of a file. And we call it static because we analyze the file without actually ever executing it. So whereas static analysis is about what a file is, with dynamic analysis it's about what a file does. Meaning here we execute the file, and depending on the exact type of dynamic analysis, this could be done in a sandbox, in an isolated virtual machine, or in the actual live environment. Now in general, and exceptions abound, it is typically easier to foil static analysis versus dynamic analysis. So now let's talk about what we can think about as the three main types of actual detection. The first thing to note is that each of these can be considered as being static and or dynamic. Signature based detection is mostly static. With heuristic based detection there is both a static and a dynamic component. And then with behavioral it is mostly dynamic. So let's now spend a bit of time and dig into each one of these three in a bit more detail. So as stated, signature detection is for the most part a purely static type of analysis. It involves comparing the suspected file against a database of known malware signatures. Now most signatures for static analysis are derived from IOCs or indicators of compromise. 
Whenever malware is discovered, somebody, usually a malware analyst, will then study it and derive, for example, a list of unique strings, such as variable and function names, specific commands or URLs it might connect to, etc. This might then get incorporated into, for example, Yara rules, and any new files transferred to a system will basically be scrutinized to this form of pattern matching. Additionally, we can also consider hashing detection as a simple form of signature detection. Any discovered malware will be hashed using a standard algorithm like MD5 or SHA-256. And then this will also be used as a signature to analyze new files against. Note that while it can be time consuming to bypass signature detection, it's also relatively simple. If a malware author knows what signatures are being used for detection by, for example, looking at Yara rules, which are open source, uh, then they really just need to change those signatures. Alternatively, by using specific techniques such as fileless malware, i.e. malware that does not touch disk and is directly injected into memory, static analysis may be avoided altogether. And defeating hashing detection is even more trivial. Since only a single byte needs to change in order to change the hash, one can, for example, just include a simple random junk code insertion generator function in the malware so that every time it compiles, the hash will be different. However, despite these shortcomings, static analysis is a useful frontline defense. It will sift out most commodity malware, which arguably makes up the bulk of malware in circulation. Now since, as I've just pointed out, signature detection can be pretty straightforward to bypass since it is so specific in what it is looking for, Heuristic detection was developed as a way to potentially identify new, unknown or altered version of malware based on suspect traits. If we draw an analogy to for example how law enforcement might try to catch criminals, signature detection is like looking for specific known individuals based on for example their fingerprints, facial features or DNA. So just as law enforcement agencies maintain databases of known criminals and their identifying information, Signature-based malware detection relies on databases of known malware signatures and IOCs. Conversely, heuristic detection is more like profiling, where law enforcement will analyze patterns and characteristics of past crimes to develop a profile of the likely perpetrator. So they'll look for certain behavioral traits, modus operandi, and other indicators that can help identify potential suspects who fit the profile. And as mentioned above, heuristic detection has both a static and dynamic component. So with static heuristic analysis, the file is decompiled and then analyzed by comparing sections of the code to known malware samples stored in a heuristic database. But the point is no longer to make an exact match. Rather, if a certain percentage of the code resembles entries in the database, the software is marked as potentially malicious and will then be further analyzed. And by decompilation, of course, I mean the opposite of compilation, meaning taking executable code and reversing it back into a higher level human readable format. Now, one thing to mention briefly is that, of course, while some languages are very easy to decompile, like C Sharp, other languages like Go are notoriously difficult. But even in these cases, they might still be disassembled and analyzed. Or the compiled executable itself might even be analyzed, which can still provide some important insights. So just some of the things we'd expect static heuristic analysis to pay close attention to include suspicious API calls, let's say for example running virtual alloc with execute read write permissions or running virtual alloc marshall.copy and then create thread all in quick succession. It might also look for high levels of entropy that indicate the code might have been heavily obfuscated. It looks for the presence of unpacking routines or dynamic code generation or it looks for code that might be modifying system settings, something that's typically done for persistence. And another thing it might look for is it might look for whether the code itself is looking for the presence of a sandbox or a VM. And it's exactly this that we will discuss now in dynamic heuristic analysis. Now, as we already learned, dynamic analysis means actually running the application. And as I pointed out, both heuristic and behavioral detection have dynamic components. So I think it's a good idea to immediately point out the difference between the two. With behavioral analysis, which we'll cover next, the application is allowed to run in the actual environment. Conversely, here with dynamic heuristic analysis, the application is executed in a sandbox so as to minimize the potential for infection. 
Now, during execution, the sandbox will be analyzed for activities that might be considered harmful. Again, like for example, running three functions in close succession that are often correlated with malware. Now, though dynamic heuristic analysis can be effective, it has an Achilles heel of sorts. And that is the fact that no matter how hard you try, a sandbox can never truly, in every sense of the word, replicate the live environment completely. And so then from this malware authors quickly derived a simple logic to integrate. Scan the environment for certain key features, and then if it's determined to be a sandbox, either don't execute at all, or execute in a way to appear benign. Conversely, if it's determined to be the actual environment, just go ahead and execute normally. And so because crafty malware authors were able to exploit this weakness so effectively, EDR solutions were able to come up with arguably their most advanced form of detection, behavioral detection. So as I just mentioned, behavioral analysis built on the idea of dynamic heuristic analysis by also executing the application. But whereas dynamic heuristic analysis does so in a sandbox, here we do so in the actual environment. Thus, the malware has no choice really but to behave as it intends to, since it is, after all, attempting to achieve its goal. It's thus in many ways the most accurate form of detection. And by that I mean it's the least easy to hoodwink. But that accuracy, of course, comes at a price. Behavioral detection is inherently risky, since it can cause actual harm to systems and data. It will thus typically be performed in conjunction with other containment and monitoring measures to minimize potential damage. So a brief overview, the malware is allowed to run and then the system will monitor it using techniques like API hooking to look for specific indicators, for example loading key DLLs and or invoking specific Windows APIs. If something suspicious is detected, an in-memory scan will be performed on the ongoing process and if it's thought to be malicious, it will be terminated and removed. Now, though it can be difficult to bypass behavioral detection, it is by no means impossible and we'll spend a lot of time in future episodes discussing a variety of ways we can deal with it. And so finally, I think it's worth noting that these three types of analysis are complementary. And in many environments, you'll find all three at work, most often working sequentially. What I mean by that is, first, signature detection might be used. And if the application is able to pass that test, it will be scrutinized by heuristic detection. And then if it's able to pass that test, finally, it will be scrutinized by behavioral detection. Great, and so I think that's probably more than enough theory for one day. Uh, but now that we have this lens, we can start thinking about our payload in a new way. So let's review our current payload and scrutinize how we might go about addressing signature, heuristic and behavioral analysis. So let's review our code as we have it up until this point. But for now, I'm going to skip all the boilerplate, you know, our preprocessor directives, p invoke signatures, constant declarations, etc. And let's instead focus only on what's going on inside of our main function. Now further, instead of focusing on the specific code for now, I want us to just get a grip on the pattern of what's happening here. Because I'll mention this now and probably many more times throughout this video and series. My goal is not to teach you any specifics or any of the details of the techniques. These come and go and always change and it's really not important for you to understand this. Instead, I want you to understand what's happening on the pattern level, the higher level design, because I want to help you become a payload architect, not a payload interior designer. And so to serve this, let's replace the contents of our main function with the five main ideas. And so for example, in this image, in the green is where we made sure our console window was hidden. Below this in pink is where we downloaded and then integrated our shellcode into our payload. Then here in the orange is where we allocate memory. In purple is where we inject our shellcode into memory. And then finally here in the chartreuse is where we then execute our shellcode from memory. Okay, great. And so to make things even clearer, for now, let's just forget about the top one, hiding the console, since this has more to do with ensuring we won't get caught by the actual user as opposed to AB or EDR. So that now leaves us with our four core sections. I also want to point out that each one of these actions are anchored by a specific function or method. But for now, let's even forget about that. Let's just focus on the idea. 
Okay, so now with this map in mind, as well as our new conceptual understanding of static and dynamic analysis, let's explore specific problem areas of our code, and then we can see how we can go about improving it. So for now, we're just gonna focus for a little while right here at the top with this piece of code responsible for downloading and then integrating our shell code as a byte array. Now, when dealing with shellcode, our biggest issue typically is that static analysis will ping us right from the go. And that's because in our loader, we're using shellcode we've generated with MSA Venom, which has been the most popular tool for generating shellcode for a few years now. And so you can rest assured that pretty much all AV and EDRs have any variant of shellcode generated by MSA Venom in their signature database. But for now, the good news is that we've already dealt with that. In our previous lesson, we moved the shellcode out of our code and onto a remote server. And we changed the logic so that it's only downloaded once the code is being executed. Doing it in this way ensures that the shellcode will never touch disk, and thus it will never be subject to static analysis. But to be honest, this solution is not perfect. In a sense, what we've done is we've shifted the risk. Yes, our shellcode is no longer hard-coded and thus no longer subject to signature detection, but at that same time, we've now introduced a new event, creating an outbound connection to download a file, which can potentially increase the risk associated with dynamic analysis. But there are a few things that we can immediately do now to dramatically decrease the risk of being picked up by dynamic analysis. So as I mentioned in the previous lesson, one thing we can do is call out to FQDN with a good reputation. So instead of just specifying some random IP like we did here, we want to instead host our payload on a reputable host like DigitalOcean or Akamai and connect to that. Now I'm actually going to go up and sign up for a cloud VM right now. But just to visually reinforce this, I've created a local DNS entry for superlegitwebsite.com and that resolves to this local IP and so let's just go ahead and use that faux FQDN instead. Now sticking with this area, another thing that immediately pops out as terrible OPSEC is this payload.txt right here. In fact, we use the terms shellcode and payload throughout our entire program. And we'll take care of the other instances in a short moment. But for now, let's just stick with this URL right here. And instead of calling it payload.txt, let's give it some legitimate sounding name so that it blends in with normal traffic like service pack one dot dat. You know, just something you would expect to see as regular web traffic, perhaps related to update services. And further, and this might be getting a little subtle, but I'm sharing this with you so you can start getting in the mindset of how you should critically analyze these things. Well, if you look at this FQDN now, it looks fine, but something that's a little off for me is having a file like this just sit there in the root directory. It just looks kind of unusual. And so instead, let's just go ahead and add a API and then v2 subdirectory to it. And I think that way it just kind of blends in with regular traffic a little bit better. And now, of course, just remember that you'll also have to rename your payload and place it in these subdirectories relative to your HTTP server for this to work. Awesome, so let's just hang out in this section a little bit longer and there's another change I think we'd be wise to make. And so to illustrate this, here on the left is a regular web request I captured with Wireshark. Now here on the right is the web request that's being sent by our loader. And so as you can probably notice, a quote unquote real web request has a lot of info our loader is lacking. We're missing a whole variety of standard headers, including the user agent string. Now these are all a standard part of the HTTP protocol. And so most legitimate software sending web requests will include these. And so for example, more advanced EDR heuristic analysis might be monitoring web traffic for anomalies. And the web request missing the user agent string and a whole bunch of standard headers could definitely stand out as being unusual. It indicates that the request is coming from a custom script or a tool that doesn't follow standard HTTP conventions and thus would likely raise suspicions. But this is a very easy fix for us since we can just use the client.headers.add method from the system.net namespace we are already using to add a variety of standard headers including the user agent string. But just note one thing, this is obviously just the generic user agent string that might actually not match the exact system we are on. Now if we really want to take things to the next level we can for example example, attempt to intercept the packet, see what the actual user string is, and use that. There's always ways to dig even deeper into the weeds. It really just depends on your target and your skill level. But for now, I think this gives you an overall idea. 
which is that if our shellcode loader is going to make requests that we send across the network, we need to ensure it blends in with regular traffic as much as we pragmatically can. One final thing I do want to emphasize before moving on is that hosting shellcode on a remote server is by no means the only or arguably even the best way to circumvent static analysis. As I mentioned last week, the real reason I like this method is because it gives us an extra dimension of flexibility in terms of changing the IP of, for example, our handler or C2 server. But in order to circumvent static analysis, there are a number of other strategies. For example, we can use some form of obfuscation, such as encryption, or if you get to the point where you are able to craft your own shellcode, then you can potentially just create something unique that has never been signatured. In offensive tooling, every single design decision has multiple options and they all always bring specific benefits as well as challenges. Each decision has its own trade-offs and your choice will be based on your skill, your goal, as well as knowledge about the intended environment. So as I already mentioned, I purposely introduced on day one a glaringly obvious mistake. I'm talking of course about the fact that we actually use the terms payload and shellcode a few times throughout our code. Now as you might guess, of course this is bound to be picked up by static analysis. So when you're creating malware, the very first thing you should do at the very least is just not call it malware. This is basic, but an essential step in evading simple signature-based detection mechanisms. So right now, let's just go ahead and let's change the names to something innocuous. Now, there are again many different options and strategies you can go with, and you can get really fancy with the naming here too. But for now, just to illustrate the principle, let's switch out the term shellcode for service and payload for update. And I think you can see overall this idea is just starting to take shape that we're kind of starting to pretend that what we basically are is just some background process that is performing a service update. And in general, when creating payloads or beacons, this is a good design decision because it is something one would expect would just run in the background unbeknownst to the user and send and receive packets to a remote server. Okay, so now that we've spent so much time looking at how our program handles shellcode and address some of the risks associated with that, let's go ahead and look at the rest of our code that will perform the three core actions once we have our shellcode integrated. Now here to start, we really need to think about the simple fact that running these three functions in a single application, one immediately after the other, with some of the specific parameters we chose, are all indicative of running malware. And I don't mean subtle hint, I mean giant infernal burning neon sign levels of red flags here. And so today will really be the first step in a series where we'll need to address this. And it's such a fundamental problem that we'll be layering multiple strategies in our quest to not get detected. And so for our very first step, let's take care of the lowest hanging fruit. I'm talking about the fact that right at the top when we allocate memory using virtual alloc, we are requesting this memory to be execute read write. Now, if you're new to Maldev, you might be thinking, what's the big deal? And of course, if you know anything about Maldev, you know this is about the biggest faux pas imaginable. And that's simply because it's incredibly unusual, like really, really unusual for legitimate software to do this. To be clear, it's not unheard of. Some just-in-time compilers do it. Some debugging tools and dynamic code generators might do it. And ironically, even EDRs may do it. But it's so commonly associated with malware that if a program is discovered to do this, you can rest assured that it's high alert from that point onwards. And so we want to immediately get rid of this, and the way to do so is quite simple. The first thing I need to mention is that since we are now introducing new unmanaged code, that is the virtual protect function from kernel32.dll, we need to of course now also include its pinvoke signature up here. And now in our main function, right below our mem commit constant, we can remove our page execute read write constant since we'll no longer be using it. And instead we'll replace it with two new constants and their associated values. Here we have page read write, and then here below it we have page execute read. Just a reminder that these are memory protection constants used by the Windows API to specify the access rights for a region of memory. These are fixed predefined values, so you just have to know them, or if you're ever in doubt, just look them up in the section for memory protection constants in the official Microsoft documentation. I know we do tend to think of official documentation from big corporations as being kind of very drab and boring. And you know, perhaps the documentation is somewhat boring, 
but to be honest, it is so incredibly useful and once you get comfortable reading it and interacting with it, it will really help you level up quite profoundly. So I just wanted to share that. I just wanted to plant a seed to encourage you to start interacting with the official documentation as much as possible. Right, and then below that, when we call virtual alloc, we change our fourth argument. It's obviously no longer page execute read write, but just page read write. And this gives us enough permission to perform our next step, i.e. inject our shellcode into this memory. Now this is of course exactly what we'll do here when we call marshall.copy, but note this line is completely unaffected. But then below it, we have our two brand new lines. First, we declare a variable named allProtect of type unsigned integer 32. This variable will be used to store the previous memory protection value of the memory region we are about to modify. And honestly, we just do this because it's a required parameter for the function. And speaking of, here is the virtual protect function itself. And we call this because of course, it is going to go ahead and change the protection of the memory region. And so here's the signature from the official documentation where we can see it takes four parameters. First is func adder, and this is the starting address of the memory region we want to modify. In our case, it's the starting address of the shellcode that we've already copied into memory. Then we have service.length that's cast to a 32-bit unsigned integer. Now this is the size of the memory region we want to modify in bytes. And we cast it to a 32-bit unsigned integer, just to ensure that it matches the expected parameter type. Next we have page execute read, and this is the new memory protection value we want to apply to the memory region. So now by passing this as a parameter, we will be able to go ahead and execute our shellcode. And then finally, we have our fourth parameter, which is out old protect. The out keyword indicates that the variable will be modified by the function, as opposed to in, which just indicates that a parameter will only be used by the function. Note that using these keywords are optional. They're just considered good clean code practices. So perhaps even in real malware, you wouldn't include them, but I'm just doing it now kind of as a courtesy to help you learn. And finally, old protect is just the variable we just declared, which will just be used to save the old protection value, i.e. read write to. Okay, and that's it. Now that these changes have been made, we've altered our code in such a way that we allocate memory that's only read write, inject our shellcode to the memory, then change the permissions to execute read, and then execute our shellcode. And this is great. This is definitely a step in the right direction. But here's the thing. As I said before, allocating memory that is execute read write from the go is a major red flag. But to be honest, allocating memory that is read write and then immediately going and modifying its permissions to execute read like we've just done here, well, that's kind of a giant red flag too. Well, so then what the hell is the point? It's because really the goal was to create some functional separation because this functional separation is in a sense potential. It allows us the opportunity to now go and do further things with it. So indeed, there are many different things that we can now go ahead and do to quote unquote disrupt this expected pattern and thus help avoid detection. We'll cover many of these in the weeks ahead, but for the rest of this lesson, we'll cover two simple ones, time delayed execution and inserting junk code. So as I just mentioned, EDRs are on the lookout for this basic pattern, these four functions being executed in quick succession. But there are practical limits to detecting this, and thus our job now is to figure out what are these limits and how can we exploit them. Now one such limit might be, for example, how long does it take between the execution of each one of these functions? In other words, if one of these functions executes, well, the EDR has to keep this observation in memory in order to ultimately pattern match the entire sequence. Meaning that in principle, if enough time passed, more time than what the EDR is capable of holding this observation in memory, well, then it would impede the EDR's ability to correlate the events. And so what we can do is just introduce some simple logic that will go ahead and add a pause between the execution of each function. First, note that right at the top, we're using a new using statement for system.threading, which we'll need in order to utilize its thread.sleep method. And then we are creating our new function, which we'll discuss soon enough, but I just want you to notice that we are calling this function four times essentially sandwiching all our malware related functions. And then here below is where we define our new function random sleep. 
We can see here it doesn't take any arguments or return any values. Its purpose is really just to serve as a pause button. Moving inside the function body, we have the first line random rnd equals new random. And now this line creates a new instance of the random class and assigns it to a variable rnd. The random class is a built-in class in C Sharp that provides methods for generating random or should I say pseudo-random numbers. On this next line, we're creating a variable which represents the amount of time we'll sleep and we are assigning it to a random amount between 1 and 5 seconds. Now two things. First, we're introducing randomness here just so our script is not predictable. And this idea to introduce randomness so as to appear like a human and not a computer is something you should almost always incorporate where possible. It not only improves the probability of not being detected now, but as well in the future. The other thing I wanted to say is that I'm choosing between one and five seconds here just for illustrative purposes, but really it should be much longer. How much longer? Well, I've asked some smart people this on Twitter and nobody gave me a straight answer. The best answer I got, well, as long as you can practically wait. So whether that is minutes or tens of minutes or perhaps even hours, there really isn't a fixed barrier of time we know we need to cross in every single circumstance. And so then it stands to reckon that we always want to err on the side of caution. But again, we're just exploring the principle here. So if we can make it pause for between one and five seconds, we can probably also do so for between one and five hours. It's obviously just a little inconvenient when developing and testing it to wait half a day between each round of execution. And so then this last line is responsible for actually pausing the execution of the current thread for this specified amount of time. And so that's really it, a very simplistic implementation of a time delayed execution just to illustrate the idea. And so now finally, once again in that same vein, let's go to our last quote unquote pattern disruptor inserting junk code. And so now finally we'll go ahead and introduce junk code, which you can think of as legitimate code, obviously, that can execute, but that doesn't serve any real purpose. It's kind of like redundant language. It's there, it fills up space, but if it was omitted, the meaning would remain the exact same. The purpose of junk code really is just to muddy the waters. And so for this final stage, let's quickly go ahead and run through the code. And so here, once again, we'll add a new using statement for the system.diagnostics namespace. And also, as we did above, we'll call our new function, execute random function in between each of our malware related functions. And so I'm not going to break this code down line by line. It's really very simple, but essentially we're doing three things. We select a random number between one and four. We then use that number to make a selection in a switch statement. And then that switch statement then execute one of four functions. So in essence, that's it. Every time this function is called, it will just randomly select one of four functions. One that will get the current process ID. One will get the system time and date. The next gets the system count in milliseconds. And then finally is a function that will retrieve the value of the user profile environment variable from the system. And so if we just zoom out, you can see that we're executing one of four random functions in between the execution of each one of our malware functions. Now concerning junk code, what's really important for you to understand is what I did here was really clean and neat. These are simple functions and you know, I'm only executing like one at a time. We could have really done it multiple times. I'm mentioning this because if you see how actual junk code is implemented in the wild, it will look incredibly convoluted and messy and overwhelming. And that's by design. Junk code is designed to be a mess. It's really meant to fill up the space and create a tangled, confused mass. But I'm not doing this here now because once again, as I'm probably going to repeat multiple times, I just want you to grasp the principle. Now that you know the design pattern, you can go ahead, look at real malware samples and emulate that to try and make more effective junk code. And there is more to junk code than just disrupting the pattern. It's also a tool to basically make reversing a nightmare, but we're gonna get with anti-reversing strategies in another episode in the future. For now, I think we've covered a lot of good ground, and so this is probably the perfect place to wrap things up. Also, just to note that I'm not going to do a demo today because it will essentially look exactly as our previous demo, but this code has been tested, it works, and once again, you can find it right at the top of the description. I definitely encourage you to download it, test it, but even better, play around with it. Change the timing, add more junk insertions, create your own junk insertions, etc. Go look at other real malware samples and just start playing around. 
I really want us to start developing a feeling for things on a pattern level. That's really what matters at this point. So that's it for this lesson. It ended up being much more extensive than I originally planned because as I was making it, there were just more things that I got excited about and wanted to add. Now, if you've made it this far, awesome. Uh, and if you would be so kind, I'd really like to know in the comments whether or not you enjoyed this longer, more dense format or whether you prefer I just publish shorter little videos in the future. I've really just gotten to the point now where I don't care about serving the algorithm's whims at all. I have two main goals, which is to make content that I'm proud of and to make content that I really believe would be useful to other people. And so this is how it manifested in this situation, but let me know how you feel about it. In any case, as we develop, I am just enjoying this series more and more and I'm learning a lot too. And I'm really excited to get going on the next one where we'll start to break our payload up into multiple stages and then eventually break it up into multiple processes. If you want to be sure to not miss those episodes, feel free to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if not, no worries, bruh. Until next time. Peace out.